You may have a seat. Uh, welcome to Renovation Church. I'm Pastor Dustin, and they didn't let me preach the first service, so I don't know how long I'm keeping you for the second one, so I'm just kidding. I, uh, I, and I'm not. I never know. I never know. It's all good, though. I'm excited. I'm always excited. If you know me a little bit, you know that I get really excited. I get really pumped up for Jesus, and I just can't help it. He's changed so much in my life. And I'm excited to, to see him change more. And I think about some of the stuff that holds me back and ties me back and keeps me from being where I really want to be with him sometimes. And you know what it always boils down to is I take my eyes off of him. Sometimes I take them off of him for a second and I focus on my woes or the things in the world. And I just take my eyes off of him for a second. And that's where I find myself thinking, man, I really, really want to figure this out. And then I just, and then I go to prayer and I'm like, ah. That's what I was missing. I was missing my focus. I didn't have my eyes on Jesus. I wasn't centered on the one that can make all the problems go away or can at least get me through them to the other side in a stronger manner. And, and, and I wanted today to focus on the right things. As I was reading and studying and, and, and praying this week for the sermon, the Lord just kept putting on my heart what it looks like to be in heaven. And I just thought, oh, what a sight. Oh, what a sight that will be. You know, we get, we get kind of excited about some stuff, right? We get excited about vacations. Some of us like to put our toes in the sand. Some of us like to go to the mountains. Some of us like to go skiing. Some of us like the old staycation where they just lock the doors, don't let nobody in, and just relax. You know, and, but, we, we, but we, we get excited for things like that. But, you know, the, the ultimate thing to get excited about is to someday be in the presence of God without any worldly problems anymore. And how awesome would that be? Oh, what a sight. I think about that, and I think about what does God really want for us? I think we get so caught up on, I got to do this, I got to figure this out. He really wants me in this. That's, that's true, he has ministries for you, and he has stuff for you to do, and he's got people for you to minister to. And you may be like, well, I've never, I don't even know what it means to minister to somebody. I don't, I don't even know this Jesus. Well, trust me, just stick with me. You will. When we get saved in the beginning, none of us know. But then we get into the Word of God, and he starts to reveal things to us. He starts to open up the, the playbook to us. We just have to remember that we're not the quarterback. There's only one quarterback. It's Jesus. He calls the plays. He's calling the plays out there. But the problem is sometimes we're like, hey, call it for me. It's got to be for me. It's not all about you. And it's not all about me. It's about God. It's about focusing our vision on him. I want to read a little piece of scripture out of Colossians. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. And if you don't have a Bible in here, raise your hand. i got some guys in here. Someone will grab you one. Everybody needs their own Bible. It'll be yours. You can keep it. Just, I won't call you out. They won't call you out. They'll just get it for you, hand it to you, and it'll be yours. But everybody needs a copy of the Bible for, for their growth in the Lord. You need the playbook if you're going to follow the quarterback. And, and, I, and I get excited about, about verses like this, like Scripture like this. So let's just jump into it. So in Colossians 3, verse 1, it says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For if you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. How great is that? When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. When I read that scripture, <clears throat> getting, getting a little choked up, a little excited already. When I read that scripture, it speaks a lot of, a lot of truths to our heart but a lot of truth to the fact that we don't follow that. We don't follow it like we're supposed to. You see, we're too often focused on the things right here. What can I do? Well, you are very limited on what you can do. God can do some really amazing things with you, 
But we got to be able to do that. We've got to focus not here, but up there. See, we want to we want to take over the role of the one in charge. We want to be the quarterback because so often we will be like, okay, I'm following Jesus. All right, I've, I've been reading the scripture. Now, what am I going to do? And it, he's he's saying, listen, what do you, what do you just because you've read it doesn't mean you have the plan. It's his still to to do and then to put it into motion and to tell us when to run and go and step and stop and shut up and talk. Yet we want to sometimes take control. And it says, therefore, if, if you have been raised up with Christ, that's the, that's, that's the, the catch right there. If you haven't been, then this isn't you yet. But when you are raised up with Christ, it will be you. What does that mean? It means get saved. Give your life over to Jesus. Confess that he is who he is, that God sent him. As, as the only redemption possible for our sins. There wasn't another way. That he came and he died for us and he rose again, conquering death. And it tells us he's at the right hand side. He's not wandering around aimlessly on this earth. He's not. Satan is. But, but Jesus is very clearly at the right hand side of God. The Holy Spirit is here speaking to us through God. And, and so we have this right here. It says, if you have been raised up, if. So if you're saved, you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. This is you. You've been raised up with Christ. We did some baptisms last week at the creek. We, that's the symbolism of the death, burial, and resurrection. We, we let our old self die, and the new Jesus-following person is now alive. And we got to die over and over again because sometimes... That old us just stands there because Satan's trying to say, hey, put this guy back on. Put this outfit back on because it really fits you well. Keep yourself raised up with Christ. Don't let it fall and then wonder what happened. Keep yourself raised up. The only way to do that is to constantly be aware of where you're watching and what you're watching for and who you're watching for. Keep seeking the things above. See, I think we get a little sideways on our thoughts on this. You know, when times are hard, and we start to think, well, I really wish I had what they have, or I wish I had what this person has, or, or I wish I could just get a little more money and I could do this, or I wish I could just be a little more brave and I could do this. You know, whenever we're trying to figure these things out on our own, when all God says is, hey, in my word that I have gifted to you as your guide to your life, I tell you how to keep your eyes focused on me. And it's not to constantly be figuring out how am I going to. Anytime your, your constant thought is, how am I, you just got to scratch it. It's a bad plan. Mark it out, throw it away. It needs to be, what does God want? And so, and so keeping our, our, our eyes and seeking on things above means we are seeking and thinking on things of, of Christ, where Christ is, not here on this earth. Christ ain't hanging out on earth anymore. Oh, he'll be back. He's coming for those that are the ifs. The ones that said, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior, and, and, he, and he washed them white as snow. He'll come back for us. He'll come back for us, and he'll reign for a little while here on earth, but it's not going to last forever. He's got some cleaning up to do from our mess. The things we make the mistakes of. We want to blame Satan for so much stuff. A lot of times, we just choose not to follow Jesus. Too often, we're like, well, it's, uh, just, I would rather do this. I'd rather focus on me. And we say, well, the devil made me do it. Well, the devil doesn't make up your mind. He tempts you. You're the one that says, I'm in. I'm in with you, Satan. I'm in with your game plan. Oh, because he's got one. It's to really mess up everything you've got going on with Jesus. And to mess up your eternity with God. Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and, and that won't change until he comes back for us. 
But while he's there, he's talking to his father, God, for us. That doesn't mean God doesn't listen to us, but that means that we also have Jesus on our side if we're one of the ifs, if we've been raised up with Christ, if we have been. Set your mind on things above. Set your mind on things above and not on things of this earth. So it can't be when we, when we, when we constantly get up in the morning, we're constantly thinking, well, I mean, I know that most of us are here. We're, we're always thinking, what do I need to do to, to be successful at life? What do I need to be to be successful in my marriage or successful at work or successful at school? What do I need to do to be able to be worldly focused success? It's a hard thing to think about when we really put ourselves in that box. But we do it all the time. How do I know? Because we probably don't pray for every single thing. We probably don't do that. We pray when it's convenient or when we think about it. But you've got to set your mind on the things above, which means you constantly got to be thinking about what Jesus wants of you and be talking to him and be, and be having a relationship with him. Do not set your mind on things of this earth. Don't let that fool you right there. It says, do not set your mind on these things. If my focus is solely 100% on being the, the best person at my job because I want to be the best person at my job, well, then is that about you or is that about God? Now, perf- listen, you're supposed to honor God in your work. But even in that, we can sometimes get skewed because we're focusing on our our potential with the, with the work versus honoring God in this moment. Now, I'm not saying you can't have a thought of, I would like to maybe sometime do this, or this is my goal. But are you taking those goals to God? Are you laying them out there to, to God and saying, will you, will you tell me if this is what you want? Because you know what he'll do? He'll let you know. If you're not supposed to be in a role or in a position or in, in, a, in a spot in life that that you are trying to achieve, but you're trying to follow his will in it, he will shut the door. He'll slam it so hard in your face, and you'll be like, whoa, thank you. But you know what happens most time that happens? We're like, oh, that's so stupid. I was the one that was qualified for that. I remember when I was trying to get promoted at Walmart for the very first time as a co-manager. And it was when they had first started getting sued by all these, we may have to edit this out, uh, by a bunch of by a bunch of women, I'm just saying, just honestly, because they had promoted all most all men at that point in time, and I applied for 27 different positions, and I lost out every single one of them to a female, and that's fine; they're probably just as qualified as me. But the whole time, I was thinking, "Ah, I've been praying for that. Why am I not getting it?" When when in reality, I I, would, I was praying that God would just hurry up and give me what I want. And I was losing out and seeing what was happening. They're getting sued. So I'm like, oh, they're only doing this because I'm a guy. And I was so frustrated and so mad when none of that even mattered. Because then you want to take it all the way back to the problem was my ego. Like I had some kind of, well, I talked to God about it. I should have gotten them. Well, it wasn't about that. I didn't have my focus on things above. I didn't have my focus on Jesus. You know what, man, he was slamming doors in my face because I wasn't supposed to be there. But I wasn't seeing that. I was seeing worldly stuff and trying to draw conclusions from things that I knew was going on and blaming, blaming everything and wondering why God wasn't helping me. But like everything else in life, when we look back, we're like, oh my goodness, I'm so glad. I'm so glad he shut 27 doors in my face. 27 doors in my face because when I finally got what I was supposed to have it wasn't anywhere near what I thought I was going to be and for a hot minute I wasn't happy but when I started to focus on things of Christ I let my ego go let the ego out let it be done and I started to focus myself on the things of God and I started to look at, at the things of God And I started to realize, well, I don't really even care about this job. It's a job. 
It's a job. It wasn't a ministry at that point in time. I didn't think of it as a ministry. I didn't talk about Jesus at that point in time because I was afraid I'd get fired. It was literally a job, and I was spending most of my time at the job, which meant I was spending very little time doing what God wanted me to do because I didn't have my eyes focused on him. Instead, I was focused on things of this world, and I was getting frustrated with things of this world. Well, you know what things of this world will do to you every single time? They'll frustrate you. People will frustrate you. Things will frustrate you. I got a standard poodle that frustrates the daylights out of me. He's so smart but dumb at the same time. But this world will frustrate you. So don't set our mind on things of this world, on the foolishness of things of this world. Because these things of this world will frustrate you and draw a wedge between you and Jesus. You have died. It goes on to say, <laughs> you, you have died, which means with salvation, your old self is dead. Your, your life is hidden in Christ. How, what does that even mean? Why would I want to hide my life if it's in Christ? Because the only identity you should have is Jesus. Well, that sounds like a lot. When people see Dustin, when people see Tucker, when people see Hayden, they need to see Jesus. Well, I see this pastor up there that spits a lot and has a fat neck. <laughs> but you know what? He loves Jesus. And that's what we should, we should be by the fruits that we lay out there. They should see Jesus. Our identity is Jesus. Well, that's a tall order. Well, being a Christian's not easy. It's, it's a battle, literal battle out there. Because you've got, you've got enemy Satan and, and a lot of demons trying to knock you down constantly. Of course it's going to be a battle. And he can make things look really sweet for a while. He can bring money around and relationships around that you don't need and, and stuff around that you don't need to be a part of. Because it looks so good for a moment. But then when the truth sets in, you sit there looking at things of this world, frustrated and angry and wondering, why is my life like this? Because you took your eyes off Jesus. Because your eyes were no longer on God and things above. They slipped down and started focusing on the things of this world. But if we focus on God, he'll bring the things in that we need, the people that we need to speak to, the ones we're supposed to talk to, the ones that are supposed to encourage us. He will bring them into our lives. We don't have to go hunting and searching for them. Just be obedient to him. You'll find yourself in places where you're supposed to speak the truth to somebody and they've never heard it. You'll find yourself in places where you're supposed to be encouraged and they're there to encourage you. You can't do that hiding in, in your house all the time. God doesn't say, hunker down and get in the bunker. End of days are coming. Get a really deep ditch. He says, get out and do my will. Get out and do my work. And in the midst of all of it, when it gets crazy, because it's going to get crazy, keep your eyes on me. Keep your focus on the things above. And, and that's where we're at. Because when Christ, who is our life, if you have been raised up with Christ, Christ is your life. There's no other way of having it. Anything else is lukewarm, and that gets you spit right out. And when Christ is our life, he is revealed. When, and, and then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So when, when Christ is your life, when church isn't just about a Sunday morning and a Wednesday evening, and then I'll do whatever I want in between, when Christ is literally your life and you're fellowshipping with these people trying to get closer to Jesus, and you're living that life every single day, then they will see Jesus, and your identity will be Jesus. And all of a sudden, he is glorified, and you will be glorified with him. Not for you, but for him. Now let's get to the sermon. Let's go to Revelation. Now that we know we're supposed to look at things above, let me, let me just throw this out there for you. Revelation, there's only one. 
You know what the revelation is? It's Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's a powerful one. I don't need multiple revelations because there's only one Jesus. So in, in chapter 4, the revelation, in this revelation to John, there's this really awesome thing happens, and, and he, gets to, he gets to literally glimpse heaven. I'm jealous. The green monster's in there. I'm jealous. Man, to see that. To see that. You know, we enjoy vacations like I shared earlier. We love vacations. We love getting away. We love escaping reality. Here's where we need to focus our mind is on Scripture like this. When times are hard, think about this is what I really want to see. I want to see heaven. In, verse, and in chapter 4, verse 1, it says this. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. He had just, he had just done the letters to the churches, right? The letters to the churches of Asia. Immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, the throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. It's a capital O, the one. And he was sitting like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. He was beautiful. He was like a priceless gemstone. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne there were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments. Garments of the high priest is what white garments is in Scripture. And, and golden crowns on their heads. Before we go any further, let's understand the power of what he's describing. This should be our most desired vacation that we never want to go home from. This is heaven. God, so beautiful and so vibrant in, in sight. Do you know all John could describe was the scenery around? He couldn't even bear to describe because he couldn't see past the beauty that surrounded our Heavenly Father. You can, you can put your favorite spot on this earth and put it on a map and, it doesn't, and look at it and pray for that vacation all you want. It's not near as beautiful as this scenery that we're hearing right here. And, and, and John, I mean, he's getting to walk in here and he's getting to see this rainbow around, these throne, around this throne with God in it. And there's 24 thrones around it for the elders. And it doesn't tell us in Scripture who those elders are. But there are thoughts out there that maybe the 24 represents the 12 tribes, and then the 12 apostles, meaning the Christians. It means all the believers. They're the priests. We're the priests right here on this place, and yet we don't focus on him all the time. We've got to get our mind right, our eyes focused, and stop worrying and stressing. Worry and stress. Nowhere in the Scripture does it say, worry and stress today. Figure it out because God doesn't know. If you have a good answer, just come back here to the end of Revelation you probably got a blank page. Just write it in. It counts. It's okay. No, the words are right here. It doesn't, it tells you, it doesn't save you stress. It says focus on God. Times are hard. Don't call somebody to gossip. Focus on God. Things are tough in the house. Don't, don't fight and argue. Stop and then kneel down and start praying. You know how hard it is to fight with somebody that's sitting there praying? That's like my number one thing in marriage counseling. You guys start fighting, somebody get down and pray. It's really embarrassing. If you're arguing, they're like, Lord, please help them. <laughs> right? I mean, how do you argue with someone that's praying? It's not on them anymore. But we've got to understand our, our authority we have on earth, which was given to us through our, through our salvation in Jesus Christ, 
gives us the ability to stay focused on God, but we have to want it. You have to want it. You want to quit smoking? You want to quit chewing? You want to quit drinking? You have to first want it. It doesn't just, oh, I woke up this morning and I, and I guess I'm quitting. I don't know. No, you got to be like, I want to quit. And I'm going to focus on God to get it done. I'm going to quit this bad habit, whatever it is. I'm going to quit. Maybe you got an addiction to television. I'm going to quit that and start focusing on God. And you're never going to do it unless you desire to do it. And listen, you can say one thing, but God knows your heart. God knows if you really want it. He knows if you really want it. I get this sometimes, and it cracks me up because I hear this. God hasn't convicted me of that yet. If you know it's something he might convict you of later, sounds like you might be convicted now. But we go on, we come back to the throne and the worship of the Creator. Out of the throne, some flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are seven spirits of God, seven angels there to minister to and protect and serve and honor and glorify God, just like you and I are supposed to do here on earth. Did you know that we're supposed to do that same job here on earth? Glorify God. Yet we look and say, well, maybe they can do it. Well, they seem to be, uh, they probably read their Bible a little more. Maybe they can do it. Well, maybe you can do it. Maybe you can be the one that can break the generational curse in your family. Maybe you can be the one in your friend circle that says, listen, I know we normally hang out and play pool and drink or whatever we normally do, but maybe this Friday, y'all come over and we're going to do a Bible study. Maybe we can do that now. Because you focus your eyes on things above and stop worrying about things down here. Because when you focus on him, things down here go the way they're supposed to in your life. The way he's designed them. Won't always be easy. There will be some hiccups because other people are involved. But you don't leave course. You don't break away from that. You stay the course. You're responsible for you. You and ultimately you are the one that decides how much you are going to follow Jesus. throne flashes and lighting I, I just can't imagine he's looking and he's seeing these beautiful colors and it's like stones of jewels and emeralds and and gems and there's lightning flashing i'm just thinking like this is overwhelming just to read i think if i'd have walked in there i'd have been like uh, uh what in the world i would think that we would be speechless right how do we say anything in that moment how would you get a word out? You're, you are just enamored in the beauty and the glory. And the thing is, is we should be enamored and, 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 be, and be caught up like that right here. We don't have to wait until we stand before God someday to be caught up in his beauty and his glory. We should be caught up in his beauty and his glory right now. Because we should be focused on it so much that that's our, that's our focus. That's all I think about. That's what makes me go. That's what makes me tick. When I get down, I get excited because Jesus is awesome. Amen. And, and God is good. He's obviously powerful. He's powerful. Yet I still trust the enemy's lies instead of seeing the beauty and power of the creator of everything. Yet I trust the enemy's lies too often. Do you trust the enemy's lies too often? I think we do. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion. And the second creature was like a calf. And the third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, 
are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they did not cease saying, they did not stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. If you think about that, they're glorifying God, and it never got old. None of them said, listen, I need a drink. I can't glorify anymore. I'm tired of it. You know, if you really get into the Word of God, you can go to the Old Testament and Isaac and some Daniel, and you'll read more about those exact things. I like it when you walk out of here and, you, and you're hungry for, for reading some more. But you'll read about those exact things. And, but what, what gets me is they never got tired of glorifying God. How often do we get tired of glorifying God? Too much because we stop doing it. We must be tired of it. How often are we afraid to tell a coworker who Jesus is because we might get in trouble? That was my biggest. If I could go back and change things in my life, that would be number 75 probably. I got a lot of things changed. But that, that, that would be a big one for me because I went and walked past so many people that God wanted me to share Jesus with them. And he told me to, told me to. And I would say, nope, I don't want to get in trouble. I'm the boss. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to get fired. You know why I had a job? Because God gave me a job. You know why I had a house over my, over my head and over my family's head? Because he gave it to us. Because he gave me a car to get there. and He gave me food to eat. And my family was provided for, just as they are now. And I don't make near the money I did then. And that was me chasing the world. And this is God saying, listen, you don't need all that. I got you. Why don't you focus on me and stop worrying about all of this? Because I'll bring to you what you need. And then I'll lay blessings. He doesn't say for you to find. I'll lay them in your lap. I'll lay blessings in your lap for you to enjoy. Not for you to search for, but you to enjoy as you follow him. If you're, if you're in this life and you're like, I follow Jesus. He's my Lord and Savior. But I don't know about any of these blessings. Well, then obviously you are focused on the woes. You need to get your eyes on God. And then the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne. And if you've jumped ahead over to, ver to chapter 5, they do that. And will worship him who lives forever and ever. And, he will cast, and they will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And because, you, and because your will, they will exist. And they were created. The only reason anyone is here is because God said, I want you. I want you. I want you. The thing is, we don't always want him back. And it's heartbreaking. We wonder why things are struggles in our life. is because we don't put God first. God first, then others. But you have to have God first. You have to put your eyes on God. Oh, what a sight it'll be someday to be with him forever. And ever without any, any heartache and sin. But we're not there yet, but we're still with him. We still have to endure the world. But it's not forever. You know, in Scripture it tells us there will be a new heaven and a new earth. One of the big questions people have is why would they need a new, a new heaven? Listen, God wants a place where no sin is ever touched. So when he redoes this earth with his people that have chosen him, the ifs, the ones that said, I am, I am dead to me, the old me's dead, I believe in Jesus. When those people believe, those are the people that are going to be the citizens of the new earth. And then there will be heaven, unblemished. Satan will never have had foot in there. He's been in the current one. He started off there. He was created beautiful. He was created lovely. He was created for the purpose of ministering to God. But his ego got in the way. And he obviously had some leadership. God had given him authority over other angels. 
Because a third of the angels believed him. They believed the lies of Satan. They believed the, the lies of, of him. And when they were cast out because they did not believe in who God, they wanted to be God. They didn't want to serve him. When they, when they did not want to be there anymore and they chose ego and, and greed and jealousy over love, they chose it forever. Now, here's what I want you to get. Like, like I don't know when your forever starts. Well, I shouldn't it have already started. No, I mean like the eternity side of it. I mean like the eternity side. When you draw your last breath and, and you're out there in heaven and, 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 you're, and you're with God forever or you're cast into the lake of fire, right? And, and here's the deal. We don't know when that is. I hope you all live to be very old and very, very, very strong leaders in the church, but I don't know. I mean, we could walk out there today and, and, and have a heart attack or something, and, and you'd be done on this earth. I wouldn't want to take a chance of not knowing Jesus, because listen, there is no, no in-between. There is no praying for someone to get saved after they're gone. You have one chance. It's the days that you breathe air in these lungs. You have one chance. Why would you want to chance it for another day? We've got to set our eyes on the things of God. If you're a believer in here today and, and you know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, then you need to get a refocus today. You need to refocus. Come back together with the troops of Jesus. Stop trying to do it on your own. Let's focus on God together. And let's be strong together. And if you're in this room and you're like, I'm all alone, I got, I'm so depressed, I got nobody. I, listen, then, then, then ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You know what? At that point in time, you got all you ever need. No one on this earth can fill the void that Jesus is supposed to fill for you anyway. No one. So maybe you're here and you're like, I don't know this Jesus. And I just want you to know what a sight it's going to be in heaven. And I want you to be there. I want you to be on the new earth with all the citizens of heaven. I want you to, to understand that you don't get a do-over. You don't get a chance again. You don't get another moment later on. You, you, once you draw your last breath, that's it. We have time right now, though, to focus our eyes on the things above, to focus our eyes on God. And that'll make our marriages better, our, our parenting better, all the things better that we can be a part of. That doesn't account for the other people in it, but your part will be the best it possibly can be if you're following God. I don't know. I just think maybe there's just so many people out there that, that don't think about heaven, that don't think about eternity with Jesus. I think we discount the fact that at some point in time it will be over. And we don't have to wait until we're 60, 70, 80 years old, creeping up toward the end, thinking, well, maybe tomorrow. Because right now, God wants you to follow Jesus 100% with your life. He wants you to follow him because he has work for you to do. And if you got problems with people, then get over it. You got problems with, with, with things going on in your life, you got to get over it. It may seem really tough. When, when I say get over it, you got to focus on things above that. You got to get over it means focus on things above that. Illness in the family, sick, sick people, you got COVID going on, you got all this stuff going on, you got financial problems, you got marital problems. You've got to focus on things above that. Stop focusing on that. Focus on things above that. That's God. And when you do that, when you do that, when you focus on God, you'll handle whatever, whatever is thrown at you on this earth, knowing that it's not about this moment, that it's about an eternity in this beautiful place. That, that we've got to see get revealed to us, just a glimpse of it. I want to see more. 
I want to run around in heaven. I want to go from gate to gate looking all over. I want to climb up to the top of the gate. I think I will be able to then. I think I'll be able to climb up there and just look out over heaven. Because I think you'll bless me like that. I want to see those things. And those things drive me. They drive me to the point of excitement in my life. That I want to share Jesus with other people so they want that. I want to be on the new earth with all the believers in Christ. With every single one of them worshiping all day long, all the time. We'll be just like those creatures that were singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Because he's not going to die. He's not going to retire. He's not giving over the reins. He's God forever. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit is sent to speak to us. All very important. All very real. All very different. All doing the same thing. So I don't know where you're at today in your life. I don't know what you have going on. I I mean, I can only know so much. But here's what's awesome. is the God that John describes right there with the rainbows around him and 24 elders and emeralds and so bright he can't even see, but around him. So, so beautiful, so, so amazing. That God created you. That God took time out of him to make you give you a soul that he expects to come back to him someday are you doing your part to make that happen are you doing your part to really make that happen or are you caught up on things of this world are you caught up on what's going on around you well today i'm going to challenge you to focus on the things above that focus on god focus on what he has for you on what he desires for you. If you're not saved, come talk to me. I want to to introduce you to Jesus. It's all about believing in your heart with just a little bit of faith and professing with your mouth. He'll take care of the rest. But listen, like anything else, if you don't want it, it ain't happening. You got to want it. You got to desire it. You got to be willing to go after it. And he never, ever leaves the void. He'll show up. These altars are places for salvation, places for celebration, places for tears to fall from the things of this world so that we can give them to God and focus on things above these things. There are things that you and I can't handle and we're not meant to. Nowhere in Scripture does it say God won't give you more than you can handle. He absolutely will let you fall into things that you can't handle because you're not meant to handle it alone. You're meant to handle it with Him. But if you call on him, he shows up. So if you come down here right now, if you come down to an altar right here, call out to Jesus, you know what happens? He shows up. The altar's yours.